Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Are you ready for me to get started? Yes, ma'am. It looks like everyone's trickle in. Okay. All right. And you have the PowerPoint? Yes, ma'am. Would you like me to share my screen? Yes, please. Absolutely. Let me get that. And I will let you know when to advance to the next slide. All right. Perfect. And Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. All right, fantastic, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, as Stephen shared, my name is Dr. Tanisha Lee. Um, welcome to my session, which is entitled Youth Voices and Advice, Best Practices for Engaging Youth Who Have Experienced Trauma. Um, and thank you personally for joining uh, my session today. I know that there were uh, a couple other really great sessions, so thank you so much for joining me today. Um, just a little bit about me. I have about 20 years of experience working with youth development programs. I worked at Georgia Tech for about 15 years in their K-12 outreach department. Um, and there I managed K-12 academic tutoring and mentoring programs that partnered with school districts around the metro Atlanta area. Um, and for the past four years, I've worked full time as an external evaluator for schools and nonprofits um, where I evaluate their grant funded programs. Um, and as Stephen said, I'm the CEO of Transformative Research and Evaluation, which is a consulting firm based in Atlanta. Um, next slide. So for today's presentation, I'd like to begin by giving you um, some background about the two programs that I've had the privilege of evaluating. Um, after discussing those programs, I'll tell you a little bit about um, interventions for each of the programs, and then I'll discuss the best practices that we've gleaned through our evaluations. So the best practices derive from qualitative data that we've gathered mostly from students through focus groups about their experiences and observations of them participating in the program activities. We also interviewed program staff about their experiences, and that's also another source of data for those best practices. So after discussing the best practices, I'll answer any questions that you have um, at the end of the presentation. Um, and the last activity that we'll, we will do will allow you to apply what I've shared today to your work. So feel free to pose your questions throughout the presentation. You can enter them in the chat box at any time, and then I'll answer those questions before we move on to the activity. All right, next slide. So my goal for providing you with information about the projects is to give you a little bit of context for who the students are and how they engage in the programs. The first program that I'm gonna discuss is called MYVP. Um, it's a four year grant that is funded by the US Department of Health and Human Services. The overarching goal of the grant is to reduce the prevalence of violence amongst youth. Um, on the left side of the screen are the interventions that students and, and their families and the community the student level interventions at the top, then the parent um, and family level interventions, and then community level interventions at the bottom. On the right side of this slide, you'll see some information about the participants. So there were 226 students who have been enrolled in the project and the research study. Um, a little more than half of them are male, um, and the majority are African Americans. At the bottom um, on the right side are the most prevalent types of trauma that youth have experienced at the time that they enrolled in the project. So as you can see, the most prevalent types of trauma were school violence, followed by community violence and disruption in caregiving, and about a quarter of the youth had experienced family violence. Next slide, please. So this second project is uh, Addressing Childhood Trauma, also known as ACT, which was a three-year project um, that ended in 2019. The goal of that project was to improve the long-term health outcomes for youth who had experienced trauma. And on the left side of the screen, you'll see the intervention activities that students participated in. So all students, whether in the intervention or comparison group, um, completed baseline assessments. Students who were a part of the intervention then entered the care village, was a, which was a 12-week session, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. And then after they entered the village, after they completed the village, students participated in therapy, they had an opportunity to participate in the summer program and have one-on-one -on -one meetings with um, advocates. Um, on the right side of the screen, students who were enrolled in this particular project, um, about 63% of them were male, and most, again, were African-American. Um, at the time of enrollment, nearly 
experienced school violence and about a half had experienced community violence. Um, and just a little bit for um, an assessment understanding. So this data comes from the CANS trauma assessment um, that looks at various adverse childhood experiences. And so this data is gleaned from um, the CANS trauma assessment. Next slide, please. So on the next slide, you'll see the, the types of interventions that students participated in. Um, the Care Village was a part of the ACT project, and it included 12 weekly sessions with advocates in, and a group of 12 to 15 students. Um, session themes included a self-image, um, building healthy relationships with others, um, that's adults and other youth, um, conflict resolution, effective communication, et cetera. Um, ACT also included one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions where students had the opportunity to engage um, with the advocates in the care manner um, once they completed the care village, that 12-week session. Um, students in both programs, ACT and NYVP, were provided biweekly therapy by a licensed clinical therapist, um, and the therapy took place either in their home, at their school, or as a part of the after-school program facilitated by the nonprofit group mentoring sessions as opposed to the one-on-one -on -one sessions that students in the ACT project participated in. Um, and those took place at the four partner school sites, either during the school day or as a part of an after school program. Um, and then finally, there was Camp Lit, um, which is Oh, I forgot what the acronym stands for. It's escaping me. Um, but it was a six-week summer program um, for youth for both programs to engage in. Both students from the ACT and NYBP program were a part of um, Camp Lit, which is an opportunity for them to engage positively um, over the summer, engage with other youth, learn some skills, engage in recreation, et cetera. Next slide, please. So now I'll get into the best practices. Um, and the best practices that I'll talk about today are divided into five groups. So I'll talk about recruitment, um, advocacy or case management, assessments, therapy, and programming. So the first best practice here is to think how you introduce the program or the intervention to students. So I've worked with program staff from a variety of organizations and this is something that I feel that isn't always given enough time program, um, and particularly one that targeted students who had experienced trauma in the past, it's very important for the program staff to create a plan for how they're going to recruit students and how they're going to discuss the program and its goals with students. Um, so both programs, ACT and NYVP, recruited students who were experiencing either academic, behavior, or attendance challenges. And the students themselves were well, well aware of the challenges that they were facing um, and that they were, some of them were having a hard time in school. Um, and some of them took issue with being recruited based solely on this criteria. So preparing for and practicing how staff will respond to students and their questions is an important step in the process. So this particular nonprofit partnered with a school district for both of the projects um, and school staff were asked to assist with recruitment. Um, the school staff were provided information about the grant um, and the target audience and were asked to recruit youth who were experiencing those academic or behavior challenges as I, I talked about a little bit more. Working with the schools is a great way to recruit students. However, some of the school staff were very transparent um, and in some instances a little too transparent about the criteria that was set forth by the project. Um, and so it gave some of the youth a negative initial impression about the program. Changed once they met with the program staff and once they began participating in the program. Um, so this is why this best practice is here. Um, and I feel that uh, with equipping staff with approved talking points or flyers that that might aid in improving their initial impression about the program. Um, so the last quote on this side um, provides a contrasting first impression. Um, so some of the youth were recruited by program staff um, and some of the youth were recruited by school staff. Those who were recruited by program staff um, at an open house that was hosted by the school um, had a more positive initial impression of the program because they had an opportunity to talk with program staff to learn more about the program. Um, and they weren't as transparent about 
um, the program initially. So uh, eventually they had those conversations with students and families about the program and the goals of the program, but their initial um, impression was not focused on, oh, we're here about trauma. Um, we're looking for youth who've experienced trauma and we want to help make their lives better. That, that wasn't necessarily language or that, oh, you're not doing well in school and you need this program, which may be something that a very transparent school staff member might share with students. Next slide, please. So the next set of best practices are around advocacy or case management. Both programs employed full-time staff who either met with students one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Um, and so here I'll use a few words kind of case management, sometimes I'll call it mentoring, sometimes I'll call it advocacy, but it's all the same thing. Um, here my best practices are related to matching youth and transparency and how both impact the quality of the relationship from the youth perspective. So for the ACT program, students were matched with an adult who met with them bi-weekly once the village was over and they met bi-weekly, as I said, out in the community. That might be going to um, the mall, going to get something to eat, um, going to uh, a park and, and shooting basketball, whatever it is that the youth um, and the mentor agreed upon um, and the student was interested interested in participating in. Um, so one thing that the mentors observed was that, was that the students preferred same gender advocates. Um, advocates work together in a team and they tested out different ways to divide responsibilities. And they found that when male advocates made phone calls to female participants, that they would not necessarily respond to those male advocates. So the advocates then had to kind of make a shift that it was a bit more taxing for them to call all of their students as opposed to one person dividing up responsibilities one person maybe um, calling students and another calling families and another planning for the for the care village sessions or other work that was required as a part of their responsibilities but they realized that they really needed to make that personal contact with students and then didn't necessarily have the results that they um, hoped for so you'll see um, at the bottom a citation, but other studies of mentoring programs have found that when there are ample um, male and female mentors for students, that same gender matching improves in interpersonal relationships. Um, it provides opportunities for um, the students to, to benefit and have more responsive goal setting. Um, and it fosters that pro-social behavior and then also youth engagement in the mentoring program. So that's one thing to consider. Um, ACC students also really appreciated the transparency of their advocates. So during village sessions, students met in what they called and what the advocates call safe spaces, where students felt that they were free of judgment from adults. So even though the advocates were adults, um, students perceived them a bit differently than they, they perceived teachers or other school personnel. Um, and the students created rules of engagement for students and staff in those care villages where there was more of an equitable um, action and relationship amongst students. Um, and primarily because students were able to drive the culture of the village and, and how students and um, adult staff would engage. So one of the things that students shared was that expressing um, genuine interest was one aspect of that relationship that helped to strengthen the program and made it more enjoyable. Um, that the students were engaged and they returned back to the program because of that, that genuine interest. And even the students would say, well, I know that I don't necessarily do well in school, but I feel like my mentor, he really gets me or she really gets me. She really cares about me um, beyond the program and beyond what they've experienced. So that really genuine interest in the youth is really important for strengthening that relationship. Next slide, please. So the quote at the top of this slide is from one of those um, advocates that we interviewed. Um, and through this quote, he really shares what he sees as a major part of his job, to create a space for students to explore and for him to be a guide and to be a resource to students. So the ability to do this is a result of that genuine interest that I just talked about. Um, and uh, a result of consistent communication. So this is something that both students and advocates found was very important for the success of the program. Um, so that consistent communication really creates a bond where students feel comfortable engaging. They're open um, to the adults that the program introduced. 
And it's a place where all staff can be a resource um, to support and guide that genuine interest without that consistent communication, it's difficult for staff to build those bonds that can then be leveraged to support students and engage them. And at times, sometimes confront them about some of the choices that they're making or, or statements that have been made. Um, and I think for students, um, sometimes uh, people get the impression that um, that, that safe space isn't a, a space where students can be confronted, but I think it only happens when the, the relationship has been solidified and it's been built over time with that, commu that consistent communication. So if you're in the first or second week of meeting with a student and a student says something that is just seems crazy, right? Um, then it's a challenge because that, that, that relationship hasn't been solidified. But over time with communi consistent communication and that that genuine interest, students are open um, to what the mentors have to share. They're open to what the therapists share. Um, so the best practice at the, the bottom of this slide is related to how advocates communicate. Um, they actively reiterated that the program was youth, youth focused, and that was their approach to empowering the youth. So research has shown that youth-centered approaches drive momentum, for successful program outcomes. So youth have a, a greater relationship, a better relationship quality and longer duration in the program, which leads to program outcomes. So when youth feel as if they are driving the program where um, they're driving the relationships, where they're learning from those relationships, then they're, they will stay in the programs longer and that will improve um, the program's long-term outcomes and, and youth long-term outcomes as well. Next slide, please. So this slide is also um, about best practices related to advocacy and case management, um, but it discusses the importance of remembering that youth are more than what they have experienced. Um, this first bullet point here is related to the frequency and how often um, staff talk about trauma. Um, so one of the challenges with the project um, at times and really early on was around assessment. So during those assessment periods are where um, either the therapist or the advocates will have conversations about the trauma experiences and the past experiences that youth have had. Um, and they're often very serious past experiences. Um, and staff were sensitive when discussing those, those uh, past experiences and they intentionally tried to separate assessment periods from program activities, right? So program activities were reserved for the their life, their school, um, and their current relationships. So staff didn't want youth to feel like trauma and their past previous experiences were all that they cared about. So re they really tried to have uh, a distinction between the two um, and that assessment periods were different from the one-on-one -on -one sessions that they had or their um, the group mentoring sessions that took place. Um, advocates also stated that at times they were, they had to be intentional, right, about engaging with youth and separating their personal clinical lens from the experiences in the youth's past and their current experiences and working with them. And I think that's also very important, right, when working with um, youth who have experienced trauma, that they are not their trauma. Right. And, and so that has to be um, a cognizant effort um, amongst all staff. Next slide, please. So in this last sli um, slide, that is best practices related to advocacy. Um, and here staff talk about intentionally using alternative words to the word trauma when talking about those experiences that youth and families have had. Um, staff most frequently use the word challenge as opposed to trauma. Um, and they didn't refer to the research study as like an experience um, or a research um, study. They use other terms. Um, the last two bullet points related to distinguishing between official program language and the language used to engage students and families. So this is similar to what I shared about recruitment. Um, it's important for staff to be cognizant of how certain language might be received by participants, right? So um, as either clinicians or practitioners, like we're steeped in trauma terminology, um, but we don't realize how the general public, right, 
um, responds to some of that language. Um, so for example, a mentor was a term that was used when talking with youth and parents and the term advocate was usually used when talking with educators. Um, one on ones um, was the program language for the one on one sessions that um, youth would have with their mentors. But when they were talking with the youth, they would say, hey, we're just going to go hang out. Right. Um, it's different language is perceived differently um, for the NYVP program. Um, the program staff called the program the Caring Community Initiative, as opposed to the minority youth violence that their children um, or some parents don't think that their children are as prone to violence as they are and they don't therefore think that their kid is a good fit for the program or in need of the services that are offered um, and even words like um, therapy um, staff potentially be, began using the word counseling um, because it was better received by by parents and youth um, so language and program terms that may be helpful and beneficial for obtaining the grant funding and talking with um, researchers or uh, practitioners um, and how that language might need to be modified when you're talking with program participants. Next slide, please. So this next slide is about um, best practices as it relates to um, administering assessments. Um, and so one of the practices that this project or both of these projects adopted was co-administering um, the assessments. So the assessment asked students again about their, their past experiences and about specific trauma. Um, and staff found it difficult sometimes to craft the questions because they didn't just go through the assessment and say, hey, have you experienced this? Have you experienced this? Have you experienced this? They did it through more of a, a conversation, right? And so staff sometimes found it difficult to craft questions, um, to ask those questions the responses of the students and also to attend to the students emotional needs um, and identify times where students needed to take a break. So what the advocates realized is that by co administering the assessments and having one advocate to focus on asking and and then having another person to focus on the youth um, and identifying times where maybe they needed to take a break, um, that that really aided the advocates in being able to be effective in completing those assessments. Um, and so advocates found this practice really beneficial, but they also then realized that they needed to take a step forward and they needed to prepare in advance, right? They needed to decide who would take each of the roles when co-administering those assessments. And they used those previous experiences that they had with each youth to identify who would be the most appropriate person to ask and record the responses and who would be the most appropriate person to attend to the youth's emotional needs and then identify a time where they might need to take a break when completing those assessments. Next slide, please. So on the next slide, we're going to focus on um, some best practices with, with, with regard to therapy. Um, and this was all articulated by youth during those focus groups that we had with youth. So engage youth in biweekly therapy sessions with, as I said before, um, a licensed clinician. And program staff found that um, therapy compliance was highly correlated to planned connections and warm handoffs from advocates and program staff to the therapists. So planning these is, is really important and it's key to ensuring that youth are aware of their next steps. So for example, in the ACT um, project, students started with the care village, right? So they formed those relationships with the advocates through those weekly sessions, through those participation in the care village and then students moved into therapy. So without that warm handoff, without the advocates laying the groundwork and saying, hey, you know, next week is our last uh, care village session and, and, uh, and then you're going to move into counseling um, and then you'll have an opportunity to continue to have some of these conversations with the counselor um, and even being a part of that handoff, right? So the advocate being there on the line, being there in person with students having their, um, their first therapy session really help students to be more comfortable um, with that connection um, and with engagement in therapy. So it's really important and, and it's a, a planning opportunity for the organization 
to plan how students will transfer and for the program staff that the youth have had an opportunity to engage with to be a part of that transition, to smooth that transition into therapy. Um, and then with regard to therapy, students shared how they really appreciated a, a relational approach from therapists. And youth use words like open or engaging or understanding to describe the therapists that they like because um, they were they had a lot of opinions <laughs> about therapists that they like and those that they weren't necessarily fond of um, and so they often use that word understanding that oh he or she is really understanding they get me um, to talk about the therapists that they like and the, the um, sessions that they appreciated so they also like hearing stories and learning about the therapist during their sessions and feeling as if their therapist wanted um, to know more about them beyond their trauma and again, beyond the data that was gathered during the assessments. And again, that's the reason why um, for the advocates, right, they were very cognizant of separating assessment time from program time um, and students the same way, right? So if they were assessed by a therapist, they felt like that's all therapy was going to be about. They're going to ask me these, these questions about my previous experiences and these past traumas or past challenges that they so it was important for students to understand and to separate those two um, opportunities. Um, next slide, please. So the last best practice that I'm going to talk about um, is related to programming. Um, and so I you know, draw upon my years, my 15 years of, of um, developing and implementing programs. And what I found that um, is that adults tend to feel like we know what's best um, and we can unnecessarily complicate programs or interventions. Um, so one of the questions that we asked the students during their focus groups, um, we asked them what they would do to change or improve the program. Um, and we were all surprised. The evaluators were surprised, the program staff were, fine, were surprised to find that all youth wanted was more time to engage with their peers. Um, we asked them, what would you do differently? What other activities would you like to see as a part of the program? They're like, we like to go to the park more often. We want to go outside and just be able to hang out um, with the other students who were a part of the project. Um, and so the program staff, they're like, well, and then go on these fantastic excursions and experiences, youth just really wanted an opportunity and time to engage with other youth. Um, so the last uh, best practices is similar to what I've shared a couple of times before, but it, it flows through all aspects of, of the program. Turn the programs because the staff um, are people that they like and they feel cared for and they feel supported. Um, through the program. So the personal connections are crucial to youth overcoming their, their previous traumatic experiences and learning how to develop those healthy and, uh, relationships. Um, and so again, youth really appreciated learning about the lives of the advocates and using the advocates' past experiences kind of as case studies or jumping off points for conversations about their lives and their choices. So um, they really appreciated, um, and I feel, um, enjoy the opportunity to engage with the advocates on, on a relational level um, and to learn from the advocates' experience for them to share that they haven't always done it right, right? That they've also had some of these past challenges that the youth have faced um, and that they've, they've learned and they've grown for the experiences that they had. Um, and I think that that was a really positive and powerful experience that um, at times that we don't, we don't think about um, the power that that can have for programs and the power that that can have um, for youth. Next slide, please. So um, before we move on to the activity, um, I will answer the questions in the chat box. So if there are any other questions that you have, feel free to add those to the chat box and I will answer them. Um, let's see. Fia asked the question, was there a reasoning behind the length of time for each project and do you feel that more time um, could have been effective? Um, thank you for that question, Sophia. So um, for each of these projects, they were either three or four year um, grant funded projects. And so the goal was, um, the reason for the length of time was to provide an opportunity for the nonprofit um, to recruit the students, um, for the students to be able to participate in the project for at least a year or two, um, and then to, to um, 
collect that data to look at um, the short-term impact of, of the project. So that was really the goal. Um, and as an evaluator, I would love to have more time with these projects, right? I think that a longer intervention period um, would certainly be beneficial for students, but it'll also provide an opportunity to collect more data, right? More follow-up data on an annual basis um, about the students to learn more about them. Um, with the MYVP project, this is the last um, funded year. Some of that summative data to look at what the impact has. Um, of the project on students, um, but I think that there will be some opportunities that we may take on ourselves as a, as a consulting firm to attempt to follow up with students um, in, in future time periods to learn more about their lives and their experiences to see a longer term impact um, of the project. Um, let's see. Um, so Caitlin asked the question, does co-administering ever overwhelm the youth? I wonder if it would feel a bit like being ganged up on when two people focus on you and are asking questions. Um, and so with that co-administering of the assessments, there was still only one adult who was really driving it and asking the questions and the other person was really um, silent, right? They, they had much more of a, a passive role um, during the assessments. I think oddly enough that some of the, the youth felt a bit more comfortable by it not being a one-on-one -on -one situation um, and having three people in the room um, by co-administering. But again, these, these are best practices. They're not necessarily... If a advocate found that it was overwhelming for a student in the future, they then wouldn't necessarily co-administer the assessment. So they're flexible, but it's something to consider because I think a lot of a lot of programs would um, singularly assess students as a about co-administering it. So it's a best practice and something to consider if, if it's something you're not doing currently. Um, and Caitlin, thank you. Uh, you said that I love that they asked to use what they wanted. Yeah. So um, I think as an evaluator, I take a bit of a, a different approach um, sometimes because I, I have learned most from the youth that I have worked with, right? I realize that I don't know everything <laughs> and that youth are the best people to give me data and to give me feedback so that I can learn how to improve, um, improve programs. And so we often ask youth about their experiences um, and what they want, right? And then what's important is to implement what they actually want. And that can sometimes be the more difficult um, process. So I wanna move on to, thank you all for your, your questions and I want to move on to the activity. Um, so in the chat box there should be a link um, to, awesome, so there's a link, uh, a tiny URL. If you click on that link it will take you to the activity that I want to engage you um, in in the last couple of minutes. And so in that um, activity um, and Stephen if it's possible for you to project again I want, there's a slide where show what the handout kind of looks like. All right, you've got it. Awesome. So if you would click that um, tiny URL, um, it'll take you to a Dropbox file that you'll be able to, to download, um, and it's a Word document. Um, and with that Word document, yep, it should be slides. Oh. These are not the updated. <laughs> Sure. They're not the most updated because it, it should be another slide after that. Uh, but I'll just walk you through it. So um, actually, let me see if I can project it. Would you like me to stop sharing? Yeah. Absolutely. If I can, then I will. Yep, let me do that. Okay, so this is what the, the handout looks like. Um, and so there are two pages on the first page and on the, which is on the left side of the screen, um, you'll see those five groups of best practices um, and the best practices that I covered in the session. And then on the second page, which is on the right side of the screen, um, is uh, those five categories um, and then some white boxes. So in the, because I, thoughtfully crafted some questions for you to consider. Um, but I would like for you to think about um, and add um, how what I have shared today might impact your, your work or your program. 
Um, so what might you do differently? How might you engage differently with youth or with families based on what I've shared today? Um, what can your program change or what can you change in your professional practice to improve the quality of your program and the quality of your relationship engagement with youth? Um, and what would you like to learn more about in order to positively impact the youth and the families that you serve? Um, so if you would take those questions, but the main question is how might um, what you've learned today impact um, your work and, and what you do. Um, so how might those best practices impact and if you would, um, I'd love for you to provide some feedback and maybe share that in the chat box and I'll read those off um, in our final closing minutes. Catherine, thank you so much. I try to be a straight shooter. <laughs> But if there are any other questions or if you'd like to share, um, how might you take what I've shared today and apply it to your work, I would love, um, love to hear that. And I think Marshall had a question. Gender pairing seems to be important. Um, did you have an adequate number of male and female adult pairs for students? Um, so with the, with the nonprofit. Um, the ACT was actually the first project and that was the one-on-one -on -one, um, mentoring and then it moved to a group mentoring model um, and that was also a function of a challenge of identifying enough full-time staff to support all the students who were a part of It didn't want to overwhelm the advocates with the number of students that they were assigned on one on one. So what they found was having that group mentoring model helped to facilitate um, more engaging conversations and more meaningful kind of dialogue with the students. And it, it was less of a I don't want to say administrative burden, but it was a less of a burden, right? So once you have, you get to 15 or 20 students that you're meeting with on a biweekly basis, in addition to facilitating village activities, in addition to the administrative side of things, that it be can become overwhelming. And so um, that's why the program shifted um, to a, a group mentoring model where students will meet um, either weekly or biweekly with their advocates, um, but they did then keep that, that gender, that same gender pairing, um, as opposed to having those those one on one sessions. Thank you for that question. Um, Nikki said, thank you for talking about and not overusing or even using the word trauma so much. Um, there are so many other students and families, I absolutely agree. Um, building relationships is very important. I want to take more interest um, in their interests. I love that. Um, Sophia said, I think as this applies to the medical care with youth, trying to engage my pediatric, pediatric and youth patients to understand that I am here to help you in your health goals and help you develop your own approach your health. But this is your life, your health, and I want to help support that. I love that. I think that it is so, um, so important um, to empower the youth, right, for them to realize that this isn't something that's being done to them. It's being something that is being done for them and that they have to be an active participant um, in that process. Working through these questions, I wonder a lot about language. How do you know what language to use? Um, as an evaluator, I love a focus group, right? Like I, I think that um, for the, the project, they've gone through a lot of iterations with language and some of it just comes from having conversations, right? So having conversations with, with youth about what they're thinking and what language they use to talk about things, right? Um, and so you can do that same thing with, with parents, right? You can describe the principle, you can describe the activity and find out from them what language um, they use to talk about it. Um, so that that hanging out came from that, right? So they talked about it as one on ones, and the kids the kids said, "Oh, I go go hang out with my." Um, so talk with talk with you, talk with families to see um, what words um, work best for them. Uh, and Stephen, how much time do I have? I don't want to go over time. Well, it looks like we're coming up on um, the end. So thank you so much for your presentation. I know I found it very fulfilling and thank you for attending to all the questions in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording soon and everyone, if y'all will just head back to the main room and we'll see what's in store for us next. All right, fantastic. Thank you so thank much. You,